come into this place. We've gathered in your name to worship you. We are excited, Lord God. It's Pentecost Sunday, Lord. We, we celebrate where you sent the power of your Holy Spirit, not just to be our helper and our guide, but our friend. So we lean into you this day, Lord God. And we are just so thankful for who you are. So God, as we prepare our hearts to give our tithes and offerings to you, God, we ask that you would just accept it. You would see our grateful hearts, our cheerful hearts, our hearts that are giving out of obedience and love for you. God, we give you the first fruits because that's what you ask. We don't give you the leftovers, God. We give it to you first and foremost, and then we give above and beyond. And so, God, we just pray that you would take this gifts, this offering, that you would use it as you see fit to multiply your kingdom. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Our ushers are going to come around now to collect those wonderful tithes and offerings. You may also give online at newportassembly.org. There's a give tab there. We also want to remind you that if you would like to give and sponsor a child to go to kids camp, you can do that as well by marking your tithing envelope um, or your check kids camp, and you can also give online for kids camp. At this time, our children are dismissed to go out to the lobby and head up to kids church. We have a wonderful time learning God's word as we enter into the book of Proverbs for this next unit. Exciting, exciting times. We are grateful for those in this church family that minister to our children and our youth on Sundays and on Wednesdays. We are a blessed people. Amen? Amen. Let's just sing this song one more time. Let's just sing together Cornerstone as we prepare our hearts to hear the word that Pastor Gary is going to bring forth to us today. So let's just sing Christ Alone. Christ Alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. One more time, Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's give Him a hand today. Good morning, church. So good to see you here today. Thanks to all of us, those joining us online. Appreciate you every week joining in with us. And this is a great day to worship God. It's a beautiful day. It's a great day to worship God. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we recognize your grace and your love to us. We appreciate, Lord, your power and your majesty in our lives. We ask, Lord, you would lead and guide us as we share together this day. God, you, are, you, are, you have taken our church so many places. You've done so many great things, and we give you praise and honor and glory for who you are and for what you've done and for what you plan to do. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. So the service this morning is going to be uh, a bit different than usual. I'm gonna begin by reading a letter, and then my talk following that will expand upon the letter. To Newport Assembly, my dear church family, I've been blessed to be the lead pastor of Newport Assembly for 47 years. Mary and I accepted Jesus, married, and raised our children in this church. My entire ministerial career has been dedicated to serving this church. I am truly grateful for the remarkable things that God has accomplished through this fellowship over the decades. And let there be no doubt that he has great plans for the future of this church. 
I, I feel in my spirit it's time for me to make a change. My wife supports me in this decision. Uh, we'd like to spend more time together with our kids and grandkids while we have most of our faculties still functioning. Therefore, I'm informing you I will transition from my position as lead pastor effective December 31 of this year. My transition does not mean I am retiring. I will repurpose, not retire. Mary and I love this church, and our desire is to serve here as long as we are physically and mentally able. The church board, Pastor Leroy and I, have designed and formally adopted a plan of transition to place before this church body for your consideration. Let me give you some background. Over 10 years ago, the church board and I just started a discussion regarding the future ministry of Newport Assembly. And this occurred as we were planning to establish Journey Christian Church in Thompson Town. Our church transitioned a significant number of people uh, and a staff member to establish a foundation for that work. And during this process, the church board and I felt it prudent to prayerfully design and begin strategic preparations to enable Newport Assembly conti to continue its mission into the next generation. Part of the plan involved planning for my eventual transition from the role of lead pastor. The plan was to search for a pastor who embraced the vision and the mission of our church. It would entail bringing that person on staff as an associate pastor for a few years prior to my stepping back. And this would allow the church and the pastor to become acquainted. It would also provide a setting for mentoring opportunities. Over a period of several years, I interviewed six pastoral candidates until the Lord provided the person that I believe embraces the culture and mission of our church. From my perspective, Pastor Lloyd Bunker is the person with the character, the vision, the passion, and the ability to assume the lead pastor position. In addition, he brings with him a very gifted family. Pastor Wanda, Liberty, and Lincoln have strengthened our church as they have exercised their ministry talents. According to our church constitution bylaws, an election by the church membership is required to place a person in the lead pastor position. The church board has a responsibility to nominate a pastoral candidate to be voted upon by the congregation. At a recent meeting, the church board unanimously nominated Pastor Leroy to stand for election to this office. A special church business meeting will be held in September of this year for the congregation to make a decision. Should Pastor Leroy be elected, he and I will co-pastor the rest of this year, and he will assume the role of lead pastor as of January 1, 2023. At that point, I will continue to serve on pastoral staff as legacy pastor. I will hold a part-time position with a reduced salary. My responsibilities will include continuing as a member of the pastoral teaching team, which I'm doing right now, uh, overseeing the dinner table ministry, and sharing a role in the pastoral care of the congregation. Our church is in a great place. We have a loving, giving congregation committed to doing the Lord's work. Ministries are being revitalized. They are blossoming. We have a hope-filled vision for the future, both for our local region as well as the greater world. We are growing numerically. Financially, we are healthy. We are blessed with a dedicated church board. We have a fantastic church staff in place. The best time for a church to go through a pastoral transition, especially when a long-term lead pastor is involved, is when it is strong and vibrant. I've done my very best to lead our church for almost five decades, and I will now do my best to lead our church into and through this period of transition. Our church leadership team is amazing. We've made every effort to prepare the way for Newport Assembly to continue a ministry of excellence into the next generation. Our responsibility is to prayerfully plan 
and initiate the process. Now it's your turn as a church body to prayerfully become engaged in the transition. The church board, church staff, the Bunker and Bellis families covet your prayers, and we welcome your questions. Again, we understand it will take some time for you to process all of this. That's why we have built in an extended period of months for you to prayerfully uh, evaluate this recommendation. Thank you for the privilege to serve as lead pastor for 47 years. It's been my honor to serve God and you in this role. And should the church body approve of this plan, I look forward to serving the Lord in a legacy pastor role with our newly elected lead pastor, our great staff, and you, the amazing church body of Newport Assembly. I'm eternally grateful to God and to you, Pastor Gary. So, like I said, I'm going to drill down on that today, and I'm going to title the message today, Passing the Baton. I'll expand on this transition. One of the most exciting events in, in track and field is a relay race. It takes a combination of speed, timing, precision, and teamwork in order for a relay team to be, to be victorious. And the suspense is greater because in an individual race, usually the fastest person wins. But in a relay race, the fastest team can lose if one thing happens if they fail to pass the baton. Any track coach will tell you that relay races are won or lost in the transfer of the baton. And when it comes to pastoral transition in the church world, passing the baton is critical. Change is never comfortable, but it is inevitable. A certain degree of stress is to be expected when any church navigates a pastoral transition. And this is especially true when the church has experienced a long-term lead pastor like me. A long-term lead pastor is usually a benefit to a church. It's, it's like a long-term marriage. Marriage partners develop an understanding of each other. There's a high level of trust and stability. They grow comfortable together. They're willing to overlook minor idiosyncrasies and irritations, right? Right? They've learned to plan and to work together to accomplish agreed-upon goals. When that relationship changes for whatever reason, it results in discomfort and strain and anxiety. So for the health of the church and, and the continuation of the mission, the transition of a long-term lead pastor must have careful consideration. I hold a leadership position in our Assemblies of God network of churches, and I've had the opportunity to witness many pastoral transitions over the years. Like the characters in an old Clint Eastwood, Easterwood Western, they generally fall into three categories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've seen long-term and short-term lead pastor transitions occur in churches where little or no preparation has been made. The pastor resigns out of the blue on a Sunday morning, and the church enters into months of uncertainty and confusion. And from my perspective, that's, that's a bad transition. Uh, the church usually does navigate the change, and they install a, a new pastor, but it can often result in painful and costly setbacks. that take It takes years to get that church back on track. I've also witnessed lead pastors who remain in their position too long. And they waited until their abilities were at a low ebb before stepping back. And, and the church suffered and declined because of their self-denial, because of their denial of what's going on, or because of self-importance. And that's, that's not a good transition. There are pastors who are fired or must resign due to some type of moral indiscretion. That's usually ugly. The good transitions are well-planned transitions. Why am I transitioning now? I'm starting to notice some changes taking place in my body. <laughs> I'm not as sharp a mind as I used to be. I don't have as much energy as I once had. I've had a very active ministry career 
I actually work more days than Sunday. I really do. I know that's shocking, but it's true. And the wear and the tear from all the years and all the miles are starting to catch up with my joints and muscles and my stamina. During my prime leadership years, I have had a clear sense of vision, the ability to dream big dreams, and the ability to share that vision with our church body. I'm losing that edge. I've been talking about this with my accountability partners, uh, my wife, my close friends, and my pastoral peers. I sincerely believe the best time for me to transition is when our church is strong and growing and unified and has a plan for the future. God is opening some amazing doors. We have some incredible plans on the drawing board, many of which we have started to implement. In a relay race, the person passing the baton to the next runner must have the strength and the ability to run his individual leg to keep the team in a position to win. This is a good time for me to pass the baton. Today, I, I presented to you the transition plan approved by our church leadership. We've done our homework. We hired a professional coach. He was previously in a, a long-term Assemblies of God pastor. He worked with Leroy and me, the church staff, and the board. And his purpose is, he's still working with us, is to ask the tough questions and the questions that were not on our radar screen. And he's guiding us through this process. Our transition plan is not complicated. It calls for a church business meeting to convene in September of this year to consider the election of Pastor Leroy to be lead pastor. If elected, he and I will co-pastor until December 31 of this year. Then in January, we will hold, January of next year, we will hold a formal ceremony to install him in the role of lead pastor. And I will then become legacy pastor. Reduced hours, reduced salary. My role will be to serve Pastor Leroy and you as members of the speaking team, overseeing the dinner table ministry, and assisting with the pastoral care of the congregation, hospital visitation, shut-ins, officiate, at weddings, funerals, and so on. The church board and I bear the responsibility to recommend this plan to the church body, and the members of this church have the responsibility to vote and elect the lead pastor, who is the key component to enact this plan. Bottom line, this transition is all about strategically positioning our church to continue our mission into the next generation. Folks, it is all about the mission. It is not about a man. It's about a mission. I've been, the, I've been an interim pastor ever since you placed me in this role in 1975. Folks, no one, no position is a forever position on this planet. We all serve interim roles. Why Pastor Leroy? I can look back on my life and recognize moments when God clearly gave me guidance and direction to make important decisions. God called me into pastoral ministry through a series of dreams, all in the same week. Several dreams each night. Same dream. I was speaking to a room full of people. I could only see the trunks of the bodies of the people in the room. And the area where the heads and faces should have been was vacant. And, and I shared this with my pastor, along with some other things that God was doing in my life. And he felt God was calling me into pastoral ministry. The Lord used other people to confirm that direction without any prodding from me. A couple years after I completed my, my education, my pastoral education, and the church body had voted me into the role of lead pastor, I was speaking on a Sunday morning. And that same dream somehow became reconstructed in my mind as I was talking, and I watched as it entered my field of vision. And it overlaid on the congregation. And the heads and the faces from the dream were now supplied by the congregation. Folks, I like it when God confirms things that way. <laughs> then there was a calling of our church to ministry in Russia. Watching news reports in the former Soviet Union when it was imploding 
just really got to me, seeing the bread lines and the suffering. And, and I found myself weeping at the suffering. And I asked God, why? Why is this affecting me so greatly? The only thing I knew about the Soviet Union was diving under my desk when I was in grade school, you know, because of nuclear attack. You know, we do these dumb drills, like hiding under your desk is going to protect you from a nuclear explosion. <laughs> but I was wrong. I, I didn't know. So I, I found myself weeping. I'm, I'm weeping at this. And why is this affecting me? And, and shortly thereafter, I was reading the book of Isaiah, and this verse just leapt out of the page to me. It was like 3D. Isaiah 65, 1, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, and here am I. That may not do anything for any of you, but I'm going to tell you, that turned my life upside down. That was vision to me. And I had the privilege to lead our church for 15 years of ministry to the former Soviet Union in the strength of God's clear leading, which God additionally confirmed through many people and many different, I mean, all kinds of supply took place to make that ministry possible. And, I mean, we had incredibly successful years of sending hundreds of tons of humanitarian supplies and distributing thousands of Bibles, tons of Christian books and literature, mass evangelism events, training new pastors and church leaders, and assisting Russian believers to plant new churches. I mean, God gave us a window to plant gospel seeds in a nation that has again become closed. The Bread Life Outreach was born out of our Russian ministry. And the Prayer Life Outreach has branched into massive ministry opportunities today. I've been asked to speak about our compassion ministry to pastoral groups and churches and other nonprofit groups, many venues, large and small. And in, in, just in recognition of what God has been doing through Prayer Life Outreach, I was interviewed by the general superintendent, superintendent of the Assemblies of God for his podcast, Several years ago, our church was featured in our denominational magazine that is distributed to our 13,500 pastors and missionaries. And this issue was celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Assemblies of God. And the magazine title was The Next 100 Years. And an article inside profiled our church as a prime example of how a community and a world could be impacted by a small rural church that took risks and gave generously and worked hard and dared to believe God. And due to time, I just can't address all the ministries in our church touching both young and old in our community as well as other nations like Haiti and, and India and the Native American nations. God has directed and empowered the members of our church body to do incredible ministry. I sincerely believe our commitment to obey the Great Commission at home and abroad is what has garnered God's blessing upon our lives. Often when I'm asked to talk about what God has done through this small church in our little town and county, I want to pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. I'm awed by the fact that God chose us to partner with him to do this incredible work, it is so amazing. There have been numerous instances where I strongly felt God's guidance, and I can look back and see God's hand of direction in the life of our church. And so I trusted God to provide his guidance to the church board and me as the search began to uh, find an associate pastor and a potential successor. And this became an incredibly frustrating experience for me. I interviewed six candidates over the period of several years. Understand, there are over 400 churches just in Pennsylvania and Delaware that com comprise our regional network of Assembly of God churches. I know many of the pastors. They know me. And the candidates that I interviewed were either not interested, didn't fit our church DNA, or, or they lacked the specific skill sets or experience. Some didn't want to take on the responsibility involved in a church that has so many moving parts. Others were just hesitant to follow our long-term lead pastor, like me. 
I remember the day when candidate number five didn't work out. I was so stinking discouraged. I, I felt like the guy who keeps asking girls to go to the prom and gets turned down every time. <laughs> so the thought came to me to go to my files and examine the lists of scores of pastors who had attended various rural compassion ministry seminars that were sponsored by our Assemblies of God network of churches over the past several years. And the seminars consist of intense training modules with the goal of enabling rural pastors and churches to become key stakeholders in their communities through practical acts of service. And because this is what opens up a community to the gospel. I assisted in these training events because our church is known as the go-to place for successful compassion ministry in our network. And so I had received copies of all the lists of pastors who attended those training events, and they came from dozens of churches in Pennsylvania and Delaware. As I reviewed the various lists, I, I noticed one event that was held right here in our Family Life Center in 2018. And on this list of names, I noticed Pastor Leroy's bunker, his name was the only one printed in all caps. <laughs> this, you're looking at a picture of the actual file. And, and I cropped many of the names and the contact information so you could see what I'm pointing out. And when I read his name, there was a quickening in my spirit. I don't know how else to explain that, folks. I remembered meeting Leroy and Wanda at that event. Their truck broke down, brakes went out, just before they got onto 11 and 15 to go back to Gilton. And we had the opportunity to converse while repairs were being made, and I remember being impressed with the couple and their heart for ministry. And I thought, why didn't I think of them before? So I picked up the phone to call Leroy, but it was just, I just felt it was silly to call at that moment. I mean, I'm walking away from home plate after striking out for the fifth time in a row. I'm feeling a little crazy. And, you know, what am I going to say to Pastor Leroy? Hey, Leroy, I'm looking at this list of names from a seminar you attended, and I notice your name is printed on all, in all caps. <laughs> you know, would you consider an interview to join our pastoral staff? <laughs> I might as well have added, we serve Kool-Aid at every staff meeting. <laughs> Obviously, I would not have presented in exactly that way, but... I, I, even though I felt they had great potential, I didn't feel comfortable making the call at that moment. I remember saying to the Lord something like, you're just going to have to help me, Lord. I'm getting punch drunk. I've just been stood up at the altar too many times here, you know. I mean, I, I, this is really getting to me. And I need some kind of serious direction. I need some kind of confirmation. And not being honest to me, the same day, Pastor Joe Pickens, who previously served on our pastoral staff, at our church, and a good friend of mine, was consulting Terry Deven, one of our deacons, regarding front door entrances of their church in Chambersburg. And Terry's company installs and repairs uh, building entrances, among other things. And Joe knew I was looking for an associate pastor and, and was praying, he was praying with me toward that end, and he asked Terry to give a message to me. And the message was to give consideration to a gifted man who may be opening, open to making a change from his password in Galton, Pennsylvania. His name is Leroy Bunker. <laughs> Terry told me the next day. Then I made the phone call. Look, I'm not infallible when it comes to hearing from God, but I have a pretty good track record. And I believe God is directing our church in this transition. Pastor Leroy fits our church culture has our DNA, has the experience, fits our ministry model. I've been giving him more and more responsibilities over the past three years. I'm very pleased with his performance. Wanda was recently brought on staff and is doing a remarkable job as family life pastor. I've had the opportunity to share with uh, Pastor Leroy the things I've learned about our church, our community, and, and ministry in general. I have mentored him and he has taught me many things. He did not join our staff as a greenhorn. He has substantial ministry experience. I need to say this. 
Leroy Bunker is not Gary Bellis 2.0. He can't be. No one can. One Gary Bellis is enough to put up with just ask my wife. <laughs> what is important is not a particular man or woman, but the mission of the church. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, and he said this, some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter. And here's the real spiritual group, I only follow Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Then in chapter 3, the same book, when one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? And who is Paul? We're only God's servants from whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your heart, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. I sincerely believe Pastor Leroy has the character and the passion and the vision and the spiritual gifts to continue the ministry of Newport Assembly into the next generation. You don't live very long on this planet until you recognize the necessity to embrace change. Those who are my age or older are very experienced with the winds of change. We become uncomfortable at times with the direction and the intensity of the winds. But in our heart of hearts, we know it's a part of life. When it comes to churches and change, most of us know of churches that a generation ago were alive and vibrant. Today, they are small, aging congregations. No young adults, no children and youth, and frankly, no desire to change, no desire to sacrifice, no desire to pay the price to attract and reach those age groups. They are comfortable where they are, and unless they change, their church will cease to be relevant, and over time, it will cease to exist. I'm glad the members of this church have been willing to strategically plan and make the sacrifices necessary to reach the next generation. I'm now 71 years of age. My life is in a compounding stage. There's a statement credited to several successful businessmen. I'm not sure who said it. The statement is, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. God has allowed Mary and me, along with this wonderful church body, to invest our modest but consistent ministry deposits in this church and community over 47 years. We've done our best to invest wisely in ministry that would pay considerable dividends in the future. And God has taken these deposits, and just like interest is compounded on a financial statement, a financial investment, he's compounded them over the years into amazing ministry gains. The Apostle Paul was reflecting on his ministry. He said in 1 Corinthians 3, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. I believe those of you who have been long-term members would agree with me when I say that our greatest joy is to see these investments continue to increase and the dividends plowed back in and applied to continue the mission of Newport Assembly into the next generation. Again, folks, it's all about continuing the mission. Mary and I feel we have significant contributions yet to make in the future of this church, our church, for the glory of God. I've been stressing to the church board and the pastoral office staff not to use the word retire when discussing my transition. I have a good bit of fuel left in my tank. I am repurposing, not retiring. 
Derek Smith, one of our church board members, desiring to assist in this purpose, made me a paddle. And on the business end of the paddle, thank you, Mayor, it has an R with a circle and a slash driven through it. Um, if any member of our leadership team uses the wrong R word, <laughs> I'm going to tell them to bend over and grab their ankles. <laughs> However, like, like me, most of them have not been able to touch their ankles for years. <laughs> I mean, look at that bad boy, huh? Pretty good. I... Uh, I need to hide this instrument because my wife may find other uses for it in our, in our marriage relationship. Seriously, Mary and I are, are blessed that Pastor Leroy and the church board is graciously offering us the opportunity to continue ministry here at Newport Assembly. Let me say this. Not every pastor in Leroy's position would feel comfortable taking this step. It speaks highly of his humility, his confidence and security as a leader, and also his good taste. What can I say? <laughs> pastor Laura and I have a great working relationship along with our pastoral and office staff, the church board and ministry team leaders. Newport Assembly is all about teamwork. We all function within our specific roles, and we realize we're better together. I've done my best with your incredible support to lead Newport Assembly to build on a solid foundation concerning the ministries we started and the personnel that we brought on staff. I've done my very best to lead our church board, our pastoral and administrative staff to this place today. And I'll now do my best to lead our church into and through this period of transition, the passing of the baton. In ancient Corinth, they used to stage the forerunner of the modern Olympic Games. And one of the highlights of those games was the relay race. And the competitors lined up side by side at the starting line, each of them bearing a torch. And in the distance, another line of men waited and still farther, another line. When the signal was given, the men would begin to run bearing their lighted torches. And when a runner reached his partner in the next line, he would pass on his torch, and that man would go on to pass the torch until the finish line was reached. Two things were vitally important. Number one, they could not allow the light to go out. And number two, they could not drop the torch. The Greeks coined a phrase out of that relay race, let those who have the light pass it on. And that's exactly what we must do from generation to generation until Jesus comes. It's all about continuing the mission that God has given us, Newport Assembly. We often view change as a loss. Anytime we perceive a loss, we grieve. Grief is, is the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. And we grieve not only when our loved ones and friends die, we grieve over changes in life. We can experience and grieve physical and health changes that occur in our body. I mean, we find ourselves lacking the strength and the stamina to perform tasks that used to be very commonplace, very easy for us. Chronic health issues can afflict us. Body parts start wearing out. Can I get a witness? Some of you have retired from the workforce. It's not uncommon to initially grieve that loss. I mean, you may miss the challenge of the work or, or the friendship of your coworkers. You so look forward to departing the workplace on that last day, but a few weeks after the transition, you find yourself struggling with the change because you have to restructure your life. Adjustment will happen over time, but change involves processing and adapting. I've been preparing for this transition for several years, and I've experienced both anxiety and stages of grief as we prayerfully worked through what this repurposing would look like. It was a challenging task until we had most of the I's dotted and the T's crossed. To be honest, even though I will be very active on the other side of this transition, 
I still experience moments of grief. Why? Because I realize my skills are diminishing. And, and I'm closing a significant period of my life and beginning a new one. Perhaps some of you will experience sorrow or become apprehensive for a period of time regarding this change. It's not unusual, but I truly believe God is leading us in the direction we're going. Worship team, if you'd come. I, I conclude this morning by again stating our church leadership team has been amazing, and we've done our best to prepare this strategy. Our motive is to prepare Newport Assembly to continue a ministry of excellence into the next generation. In passing the baton, we will honor our past as we move forward to the future. It's a responsibility of church leadership to prayerfully and strategically create a plan and then present the plan to the church body. We've done that. Now it's your turn as a church body to prayerfully process all of this and then make a very important decision in September of this year. The church leadership, the Bunker and the Bellis families covet your prayers. We welcome your questions. Some of you will need time to process this. That's why we have months now to process. My heart is filled with gratitude for your love and acceptance and support for Mary, my family, and me over these many years. And God willing, and should you determine to support the strategy presented today, I look forward in the years ahead to serve our new lead pastor and you in my role as legacy pastor. Thank you, Newport Assembly, my dear church family. I love you. Thank you for your incredible guidance. Thank you, Lord, for your perfect will. Thank you, God, for allowing us to partner with you, not only in the years past, but in the years ahead of us until Jesus comes back to this place. God, we love you. We look forward to walking with you every day of our lives. And we look forward to the great things you have in store for us as individuals and families and also as a church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. thank you. We're gonna sing a closing song, which I think is very, very appropriate. It's called Jesus Be the Center of an All. Folks, that's what it's all about. If you need prayer, there'll be people off to the sides here who'd be happy to pray with you on specific needs you might have today. Thanks so much for being here today. Those online, Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Jesus, be the center of it all. Jesus, be the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, again, Jesus be the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, and nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus. 
Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you jesus jesus and nothing else matters nothing in this world will do Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Nothing else matters. And nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the
moments we come before you and we boss our hearts around, Lord. We boss our feelings around and we remind ourselves that it is about you. And we are grateful, God, for those you have put in our path to help us, to help us grow. And we are grateful, God, that they're still in our paths. And we thank you for this church family. We thank you for those that are sitting beside us and that are among us and watching online, God. And we thank you for those that you are going to bring into this church family to continue to strengthen it and make it strong for your kingdom, God. Thank you for this community that you have called each of us to, to minister to, God. And so in these moments, as we continue to move forward and navigate through these things and process things, God, we lay it at your feet because we remember it's all about you. So forgive us, God, when we've made it about ourselves. And so, Lord, from our hearts to the heavens, Jesus, be the center. It's all about you. And Jesus, be the center of your church. And we proclaim that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.